No. No buzz. Just Bees Book Club. I have now read the first gothic novel, Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole, published, I believe, initially in 1674. Is that right? Um, no, no, that's not right. 17, 1764. Maybe that's right. Um, first edition of 500 copies appeared in, on the 24th of December, 1764, although the title page carried the date of 1765. Second, second printing was 76, uh, 1765. Um, yeah, so, 1764, uh, Horace Walpole, son of the first Prime Minister of Great Britain, I guess, was, uh, was the, was, was his parentage? <laughs> um, uh, fascinating little bit of thing there that I found out a few days ago. Um, and, and the first gothic novel by, I think, most... Uh, most claims. Um, Gothic's a um, genre I have a, a, a certain fondness for um, and had heard about this across, you know, reading about the Gothic novel occasionally and came across a copy about, came across this copy about a year ago and kind of snagged it and just sat on it for a while and then I was like kind of between books and didn't know what nonfiction I wanted to read and I was either like continue King or read this and I asked a co-worker and she said you're gonna read the king anyway. You've read the gunslinger before. I was like, you're right. You're right. And I'm glad I read this because it's very funny. Um, I, f I maybe foreground the the fact that this is the progenitor of the gothic novel to say that my actual reading experience of this book is that it's a comedy of manners, basically. Um, it is the story of the castle of Otranto, um, the sort of leader of which is a kind of a shithead named Manfred, who is marrying off his son to this girl named Isabella, who is like a princess of a neighboring kingdom. Um, his son is sickly, uh, sort of Proustian vibes. Um, but he doesn't succumb to his asthma, or uh, associated. Uh, he succumbs to a giant um, helmet landing on him <laughs> as he's walking um, toward his birthday party slash wedding day. Uh, just a helmet just falls out of the sky, crushes him, Conway's dead. Um, Manfred takes this very poorly, and one of, one of, the, one of the actual harrowing scenes in this book, um, something that made me deeply uncomfortable, um, where Manfred decides he's, uh, he is going to divorce his wife, the, the, the queen of the Otranto, I guess, um, and marry Isabella himself to so, so solidify the political leanings that he was trying to solidify with his son um, and to produce another heir um, in, a, in a very upsetting scene between himself and Isabella where he basically lays this all out to her uh, as he's like trying to assault her basically. Um, large part otherwise though like there's a um, I've seen it framed as the story of Manfred. I've seen it framed as the story of Isabella. There's also Matilda, who's a central character. Um, that is Manfred's daughter, the elder sister of Conway, who has been sort of like ignored by Manfred for all of her life for, you know, not being a suitable heir, basically, um, who, who, who Matilda loves her father very dearly despite his um, complete shittiness. Um, there's also Manfred's wife, whose name, I can't call to mind immediately. Um, let's see. Now, Bianca is Matilda's sort of um, a servant. Um, I can't remember the wife's name. Uh, it's definitely not her story. Um, there's also the story of, of Theodore, who is a young peasant who happens to um, get accused by the by Manfred of being the uh, sorcerer who threw the <laughs> giant helmet onto Conway, um, get, and so becomes imprisoned in the helmet. But then there's a crack in the helmet, so he's in the dungeon at one point. 
and then he um it's, he's sort of like again comedy of his, of errors his way through being discovered to be not just the son of the local priest who is trying to dissuade Manfred of his machinations, but also the true heir of the castle and, and of Otranto um, by way of uh, Matilda's dad, Manfred, trying to kill Isabella, but actually accidentally killing Matilda. And, um, and then some, some shenanigans happen. Um, it's goofy it's it's really goofy and fun um i'm sure it didn't read that way in 1764 because it was initially published as like a translation by a different person of an older italian text i think he the initial sort of um preface lands it around like um somewhere between like 1100 and 1500 and there's like you know because there's a bunch of references to the crusades and stuff the gothic stuff etc etc um and you know i don't know like what was uh northanger abbey i believe is is austin's um sort of gothic pastiche um i've never read that one but like and from what i was looking into recently i don't think otranto specifically gets name dropped in that book but like if by austin's time <clears throat> the gothic was seen as a thing that was sort of worthy of pastiche for its own self-seriousness i'm assuming otranto wasn't really read in the late 18th century as uh as humorously uh, as i think it is and i think i was like sort of twigged onto this reading actually in there's like a handful of, of prefaces and introductions to this i want to say it's in the introduction to the second edition um walpole when he announces that he was the actual author that he fabricated the the fact that it was like a, a, an historical document. Um, I think it's him who mentions that um, his sort of goal with the book was to marry the sort of new naturalist movement, um, whereby characters were thought of as people rather than sort of um, symbols or allegories or, um, you know, uh, keys for sort of court drama, that sort of thing. Um, there's a specific term that I've been blanking on, um, the Ramona Clef sort of tradition um, uh, with the sort of more um, supernatural, like sort of pre-enlightenment fiction. Um, so sort of taking the spooky stuff, but um, inserting into that characters who act like rounded human beings. Um, it's sort of, again, I'm 90% sure this is Walpole saying this in the introduction to the second edition. Um, and he, he sort of explicitly mentions Shakespeare as like a, uh, as a, as a um, progenitor of this, um, or, a, or an inspiration for this. If I'm wrong, it might be, uh, no, oh, yeah, okay, that's, yeah, this is the preface to the second edition. Yes, okay, so this, I am remembering these things correctly. Um, he, like, he... He talks about how Voltaire would say this is terrible, but, you know, Shakespeare. Um, and that made me just think of, um, though I've never actually read it, um, I've never actually read Hamlet, um, sort of a, a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern character, or like a thing I'm more familiar with is, you know, like a, um, Falstaff, because I, I did the Henry ad for a, um, for a class, I guess an independent study that I never got credit for um, back when I was in university uh but like it, yeah it the comedy is very shakespearean to me especially in that falstaffian way or my sort of um culturally osmosed uh um sort of goofballs there's like a very early example of this that i think is really good i did not um i did not i did not write any notes on this one um but there's like a moment when there's a search party in the dungeon because because Manfred has made his advance on Isabella and she has escaped and, and run away and they think that she might be in the dungeon like getting out that way um, Hippolyta is the name of the mom um, uh, and there's like these two servants who Manfred keeps sort of like being like what did you see and then 
the 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 bit is I'm I don't remember their names either, but the bit is basically like he'll talk to one of them and they'll say like, oh well me and uh, X character name, and then the other character will immediately cut in and say yeah yeah, uh, other character's name and I we saw. And then they, like, sort of do this sort of, you know, Marx Brothers routine, basically. It's not really a Marx Brothers, more of a... Whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but, like, they'll, they, like, sort of talk over each other, and they're sort of, they're sort of being buffooner, buffoonery. They're, they're doing a buffoonery. Um, and it's, and it's, I, it's genuinely worked for me in, like, a comic timing sense, which is, like, shocking. Um... Uh, and just like you know, the and then there's the things that are like clearly supposed to be uh, morose or, or 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 frightening that just um, don't sort of translate like these sort of belabored prophecies that sort of pop through the text um, that are like. Well, the thing is, like, the main prophecy is about like when the true owner of this castle has grown too big for like has grown too big like the the true ownership will be restored or something like that and it is a giant helmet that lands on the kid like um there's a fucking <laughs> it's not this but there's there's a monty python scene in this there's the there's the knight there's the it's, it's just a flesh wound bit that it's like Theodore and Isabella have met out in the woods as as Isabella is trying to escape, and um, and they hear something, and Theodore immediately like pledges his. I mean, Theodore also just falls in love with every woman he sees, um, but Theodore like pledges to like protect Isabella with his life, and there's this like imposing knight who has come to challenge Manfred for his title, and Theodore and this and this knight who's never lifted his visor. Um, get into a into one on one duel, and they like Theodore starts to win, and the knight like is basically like, "You can't beat me. I have God on my side," or whatever, in a very like he's the Black Knight in Monty Python sort of way. And then Theodore just like f completely wrecks him, and he takes his helmet off, and he's like, "Oops, that's uh, Isabella's dad. Whoops, <laughs> it's Is Is Isabella's dad. He's been missing for you know twenty years or ten years or whatever." Um, off of off of the Crusades, and he's the actual owner of the castle, uh, and the the like. Especially especially the Monty Pythonish bit is like Isabella rushes to him, and they like have he has his like last words saying like how oh, I would I would like um, you know I've I love you I'm so glad to get to I get to die like seeing you my daughter for the first time and you're so grown. Um, and I can't wait for you to, like, grow better. And Theodore's like, like, you're hurt real bad, but, like, can we get you, can we just get you to the castle, my dude? Like, they have, like, doctors there. Like, and you're, like, not in good shape, but, like, you're not. And he's like, with my dying breath, I, I, you know, I, I regret so much that I had left you behind. And, and then they just take him to the castle and he gets healed up and, immediately falls in love with Manfred's daughter, Matilda, and it's, it's silly. It's a silly book. It's a silly book, and I like it. Thanks for not watching.